What does the world look like at 70,000 feet? Oh man, small. You can see many cities that on the ground are hours apart and now they just seem minutes apart. That intelligence that we were gathering was going to the President of the United States, the Secretary of Defense. It was on their desk that day. In my opinion, it's probably one of the best sensors we have. What was the highest you ever flew? I can't say, 70,000 plus. Hi, I'm Rick Crandall, host of the Behind the Wings podcast. And in this episode, we are really excited to have with us a retired U-2 pilot. That's right, Lieutenant Colonel Josh Caddis. We're going to the edge of space in one of the most iconic spy planes ever built. Josh discusses training in the U-2, flying missions at 70,000 feet and its aerial reconnaissance capabilities. This is going to be really cool. It's time to go Behind the Wings. All right, let's get started. Lieutenant Colonel Josh Caddis, welcome. Thank you. I want to talk back to how this all started. Academy from 97 to 2001. At the Academy, you got a degree in history. The historical significance of the U-2 and what was going on ever crossed your mind as a history major? So absolutely, yeah. You're flying a U-2. Um, you're looking at geographic borders and landscapes you know, all over the world. Um, and you can't help but think about what happened previous uh, to you being there and or what's happening at the present in terms of you being a part of that continuing history and legacy. Every day we flew that, it was having an impact. That intelligence that we were gathering was going to um, combat leaders, uh, the President of the United States, the Secretary of Defense. It was on their desk that day, basically, um, enabling them to make those decisions um, that would affect our country and potentially the world. When did you know it was in your DNA to be the U-2 pilot? Oh man, that happened early on. When I was then flying tankers out of Kadena in Japan, and a friend of mine that I went through pilot training with, he had just interviewed and gotten hired by the U-2 program. You know, it's, if he can do it, I can do it, right? So I started working on that interview package and making sure I met all the requirements. And I got a wing commander recommendation. They sent my package off to Beale and it got analyzed. And I finally was allowed to uh, come out to Beale and interview uh, for the U-2, which is about a two week process. All right, so this U-2, an American single engine high altitude reconnaissance aircraft capable of flying up 70,000 feet. It's known as one of the toughest aircraft to fly in the world. So what did the training for that look like? Part of that training actually was the interview itself. They bring you out for that two week interview. You interview with the squadron commanders and directors of operation for both U-2 flying squadrons, the 99th and the 1st, as well as the ops group commander or his deputy. On top of that, you go through egress training, which is how to get out of the airplane in an emergency, either through the ejection seat or what have you. They also suit you up in the high suit, the pressure suit for an hour to make sure you're not claustrophobic because we have had potential candidates self-eliminate just wearing the suit. Flying the U-2 is expensive, training you is expensive. Let's Let's yeah. get this out of the way first, if, it's, <laughs> if that's gonna be a problem. If you pass the first week, they invite you back for that second week, now you're flying the airplane with an instructor, about two and a half hours each time you go up. And they're just wanting to see if you're on the learning curve for landing the airplane, because that's where most of the accidents happen. And that's what makes it difficult to land. The goal by the end of that week, the three flights, is to get you to land solid tailwheel first every time on center line, wings level. If they can get you to do that after three, then they know that your, uh, your odds of passing the training program, which is roughly nine months, is pretty high. If they like you and they think you're on that curve, they invite you back to become a U2 pilot. That first solo, remember it pretty clearly? It was raining. The weather was pretty terrible. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> we still went. My wife got to come along in the, the chase car and follow me down as, as I was doing the touch and goes. So that was, that was exciting for her and me. Definitely uh, an element of don't screw this up in front of your <laughs> wife, but that was really good. And I mean, it was just a total elation when you're done. You know, your squadron mates are out there, they're all cheering you on as you, after you land and yeah. you get handed the bottle of champagne and you pop the cork on it and you celebrate. Yeah, and that's just the beginning. Uh, talk about the suit specifically, about uh, the the unique design about it. I mean, go through the process of putting this bad boy on. Showing up for just a high mission, whether it's training or yeah. um, or an actual mission, we would do some exercise enhanced pre-breathing. 
um, where we get on oxygen and exercise for about 10 minutes on a, a treadmill or an elliptical machine or whatever yeah. uh, to try and get all the nitrogen out of your blood. That later changed when they modified the cockpit. We didn't have that requirement anymore. We just had to get on oxygen an hour prior. So you're trying to get all the nitrogen out of your blood with 100% oxygen. So you're wearing an oxygen mask the whole time after you've already put your long underwear on underneath, along with, it's called a UCD, a urine collection device that we'd wear, because um, obviously long missions, you're gonna hydrate a lot and you're gonna need to go to the bathroom. So you'd attach that, uh, you'd step into the PSD room, they got these huge chairs, your suit's already laid out in front of you um, with the basically the, the legs of the suit rolled inside out so that you can get your feet in and then they can basically roll it up. So you're rolling those up, you're trying to get the, the pant legs on as high as you can, and then you've got someone that's helping you feed the rest of the suit over you because it's got a big zipper in the back, and you're getting your arms through and your head through the helmet ring. They zip you up in the back, they bring your boots, they put those on, which are they're like five sizes too big. They're just huge. Uh, they got spurs on them that attach to the ejection seat to pull your feet back so that you don't get any flailing injuries if you have to eject. So those are a little awkward to walk around in. Um, after that, they, they'll put the helmet on you. They'll take the helmet ring and they'll lock that up and you'll be breathing 100% oxygen at that point. And this is after you transfer the mask off, right? Uh, they'll put your gloves on and they'll run, run you through a whole bunch of tests. Uh, they'll inflate the suit using primary, secondary modes because um, we got a primary, which is just airflow. The secondary is where they basically, it locks out airflow from leaving the suit in the event of a rapid decompression or ejection at altitude. And they're testing the integrity of that suit um, before you step out. After that, you just kind of sit there and wait until it's time to go walk out to the airplane. What are you thinking about uh, when the helmet seals? <laughs> I mean, you're in it now, right? You're not, not going yeah. anywhere. You got about a whole long day ahead of you here once you're locked into that thing and it's like mission on. I mean, right, it's like, you're thinking about the mission that's yeah. about to happen. Um, some guys will run through emergency procedures, like what am I gonna do if this happens? Yep. Um, you've already briefed all that stuff, but at the same time, you're just kind of getting it fresh in your mind. If it's at a location that's extremely hot outside, you're trying to psych yourself up because now you're gonna go outside and sweat uh, before takeoff because there's no airflow uh, coming into that suit until you get airborne. Yeah, really just trying to hype yourself up. And the great thing about the physiological support detachment troops is they'd always play your favorite music. So whatever would get you amped up. I think at one point they even had a crystal ball and they turned into a disco. <laughs> do what you gotta do. G suit to pressure suit, the step up from one to the other. The pressure suit more restricted in movement. I mean, you got several layers of cloth or material between you and the outside world, plus this fishbowl of a helmet on your head that weighs quite a bit. So you're a little desensitized to the world around you. You don't have the same field of view. You don't have the same mobility as you'd have, obviously, in a G-suit. So you have handlers. Just to get out to the airplane, you've got a physiological support troop carrying your oxygen tank um, behind you and kind of you know tapping you on the shoulder to point you in this direction to walk this way because you you have no idea. Even more so when you get in the airplane. I mean, the joke is you lose about 20 IQ points just putting the suit on. Things just happen slower. From training wheels during takeoff and then there's chase cars relaying information during landings. What's the choreography of that whole thing like? So you kind of mentioned the pogos are kind of like training wheels. Essentially, yes. They keep the wings off the runway while you're taxiing. So the whole idea, especially heavy weight, all the fuel is in the wings. So those wings are gonna start to flex down and that's what's pinning the pogos in with the exception of you've all obviously got the, the pins in as well for taxing. They're free castering the, the pogos, so they just spin around. Okay. So there's no steering happening with the pogos. That's all in the tail wheel. You didn't ever have one stick. No, um, that, we do have an emergency procedure for that because that has happened in the past. A stuck pogo or a hung pogo is yeah. what we call it. And it's an emergency. I no, mean, no doubt. We have one opportunity to try and get that pogo to fall away as we're flying the airplane. We'll come back in for another pattern. We'll fly up initial and we'll slow to a certain speed to see if we can drop the pogo in a safe area. And if that doesn't work, landing with a pogo is very contentious, but it hasn't happened that much. Certainly not when I was flying. This chase car, I'm, I'm curious about this. I mean, that's just your eyes on the plane on the ground, right? The mobile, he's another U2 pilot, another qualified U2 pilot in the chase car. He's essentially our wingman on the ground. You know, we talked about the high suit. We're wearing that fishbowl. It desensitizes you, you lose a couple of IQ points. You also lose a little bit of your field of view. And the cockpit's very small anyways. You've got 
you know, some metal structure over the front that kind of removes some of that field of view as well. So mobile's there as your eyes and ears on the ground. He can relay trends in airspeed, energy state of the aircraft as you're coming down final. Um, that's what we train to. So he can tell if you're slow or fast. He may not know exactly what speed you're at, but he can gauge the energy state of the airplane just based on how high or low the tail is coming down final. Then once we cross the threshold at about 10 feet, the mobile's giving you calls from 10 feet all the way down to touchdown based on how high the main gear is off the runway. The mobile, he rolls in behind you because he's also trying to get a check on do you have left or right rudder in or do you need to apply left or right rudder to straighten the aircraft fuselage with the center line because you don't want to land in a crab on uh, this airplane. You land in a crab in the U-2 and you're in the dirt within seconds, yeah. It's very hard to get back to the center line if you don't land straight. The U-2 famously flies at 70,000 feet, the edge of space. There, body fluids can start to boil. Describe the physiological and operational challenges of conducting missions at such high altitudes. How, how do you even mentally prepare for this? You just get used to it mentally, I think. Everybody's got their thing when they're flying long missions. Some guys will read books. Other guys will take have mission boards that are just big cardboard boards with paper on them. And some guys will take extra mission boards with just blank sheets of paper, and they'll write letters to their kids. They'll write their laundry list of things they gotta do after they land. Um, as far as physiologically, good rest, physical fitness, nutrition. Before starting a mission, we'd, we'd make sure we had a low residue diet. They call it high protein, low residue, because you didn't want to have to go number two yeah. at altitude. That was also an emergency. So hydration is important, obviously. You try not to work out in the airplane. You want to be sitting like this for the next 10 hours and not taking a lot of notes. Reason being is you can get decompression sickness up at altitude, and you'll start to feel it as little bubbles start to form in your extremities if you start riding a lot, um, and even in your elbow joints and stuff like that. And we've had some pretty serious cases of that uh, in our past. And while I was a U-2 pilot, they upgraded the cockpit to lower the cabin altitude in the cockpit to something acceptable. And those cases of decompression sickness were all but erased. So I became very comfortable to fly long missions in. What does the world look like at 70,000 feet? Oh man, small, smaller. <laughs> you know, you can see many cities that, you know, on the ground are hours apart, and now they just seem minutes apart along the coast and that kind of stuff, especially in California. You get that delineator between, or they call it the terminator line between uh, night and day. Um, and you can see that even at 32,000 feet. Yeah. But up at 70, it's, it's very well defined. The other thing that's interesting is, you know, you look up at the sky at a 747 that's at 35,000 feet, and I'm looking down at a 747 that's 35,000 feet below me. It's, that's it's crazy. a weird feeling. <laughs> <laughs> that is crazy. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. that. That is pretty cool. What was the highest you ever flew? I can't say. Okay. 70,000 plus. It was high. Yeah. I'm sorry, Rick, I can't tell you that. <laughs> During your mission, ever followed by aircraft at lower of you know, trying to see what you're up to or ever any any of that going on? If it happened, I wouldn't be able to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Fair enough. We have sensors that can see out hundreds of miles or listen out hundreds of miles. So it's it's all about line of sight. It's why we have satellites, much more range in terms of where they're looking. Plus it's much more efficient to fly at altitude. Um, our fuel burn at altitude's not much more than it is at idle on the ground. Um, so you can serve a lot of gas and obviously that wingspan helps. Originally built uh, to spy in the Soviet Union during the Cold War, several different aerial reconnaissance techniques, signals, imagery, electronic measurements, signature intelligence. The plane can track almost everything. Anything more you can share about those capabilities? I mean, the U-2's got several different types of imagery sensors they can use to collect with, uh, from advanced synthetic aperture radar to electro-optical, which is essentially like your digital camera on your phone. Just way better. <laughs> lots of uh, lots of shock absorbers in that sensor so it can see you know through the atmosphere long distances and come out with a very clear picture. As advanced as the aircraft was, you two used wet plate photography, right? As part of the surveillance and used it for a while. So that's the uh, optical bar camera, yeah. the wet film you're talking about. In my opinion, it's probably one of the best sensors we have. You think about wet film, you can blow that up to any size and the resolution stays the same. As opposed to a digital camera, it starts to get pixelated at a certain point and then you can't identify certain things. So wet film is really good, really valuable. I wanna go through the, the descent, right? Take me through that whole process down. 
Okay, so as you're getting ready for the descent, we actually do, we'll do a fuel balance check because all that fuel's in the wings and we want to land with a balanced wing so that we don't drag a wing tip after we land because that's when we'll end up in the dirt. So you'll do a couple of fuel balance checks as you get closer uh, to landing where we basically slow the airplane down to not necessarily stall speed, but approaching stall up at altitude. And you click the autopilot off and you just see which way the wing's going. Then you start transferring fuel in the opposite direction. So do that a couple times to make sure you're balanced. And then when it's time to, to head down, the first thing you do is throw the gear handle down because we need all the drag we can get. You'll put the flaps to gust up, which takes some stress off of the uh, uh, vertical tail, the, uh, the empennage in the back. Uh, speed brakes out, and then we have lift spoilers that will that will come out on the wings, and we'll extend those. Um, and then you're just coming down fast, and that's about it. It's just now you're just I don't want to overspeed the airplane, so you're locked onto that airspeed sure. all the way down, and you're hand flying it. There's the autopilot's not really efficient, or it's not optimized for low altitude flight. It's optimized for anything above sixty thousand. So you're clicking everything off, and you're hand flying for the last hour, which is fun. And there's a chase car and probably your wife and kids. <laughs> your wife and kids. Now the neighbors are with <laughs> They got them. out of school early. <laughs> yeah. You get out of the U2, you've got the crew helping you because they helped you. You had those people putting you in that suit to begin with. Those people getting you out of the suit when you're all done. When the helmet comes off, is that a ah, moment? Oh, yeah. So probably not a lot of people know this, but as you're taxiing back after landing, you're pulling everything off. Are you? You're trying to unstrap from the airplane while you're taxiing so that as soon as that canopy comes open, you can just stand up, hand the helmet to the, the mobile um, and get out of there. But obviously getting out of the suit is a little bit more involved. Yeah. You definitely need help with that. You're ready. Yeah. And I need something to drink and something to eat. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And a nap. <laughs> So with the uh, U-2 currently slated to be retired next year, is flight reconnaissance, is it all shifting the satellites now? Is it, there's still a, a need. Absolutely, there's still a need for terrestrial in-atmosphere reconnaissance platforms. Uh, satellites are predictable. I know when a satellite's gonna be overhead, I can hide all my equipment if I need to, knowing that. The great thing about the U-2 is that the pilot could retask it immediately and as soon as he gets word, hey, there's something happening over here, he turns the airplane immediately um, to go look at it. So I think that's the advantage. Still working in those, those high altitude areas are important too. Get a call, Colonel Caddis. We want you to uh, be in charge of designing the next generation of high altitude <laughs> reconnaissance aircraft. What's one feature you'd include in it that the U-2 didn't have? I don't know if I could actually talk to that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Because that would probably reveal too many things. A comfort feature? A, a, do you oh, want a comfort to... feature? Well, I don't, I don't know if it's going to be manned. It'll probably be unmanned. That's probably where we're going. Definitely, you want persistence. You want something that can sit and loiter for long periods of time. And then probably, it's probably going to need to be stealth. So later in, in your career, you uh, became a U-2 instructor, evaluator, training new pilots for, for one of the most selective aviation programs in the world. What's something most people wouldn't know or wouldn't uh, expect about what it takes to become a U-2 pilot? Several things. So one, resilience. It's very difficult to learn and then obviously the willingness to learn and take instruction what's the expression what the uh the mind can conceive the body can achieve if you kind of have that mindset going into it you can get anywhere hey thanks for being with us no, it appreciate, was great. It. Thank appreciate you. having you here my pleasure that'll do it folks we hope you enjoyed josh's many great stories which one was your favorite how about letting us know in the comments okay and to hear the full interview go check out episode 55 of the Behind the Wings podcast wherever you listen. If you subscribe now, thank you so much. And if you don't, just subscribe already and come visit the museum to see more than 60 air and space craft in our historic World War II era hangar. We'll see you next time right here on Behind the Wings.